Hey, it's Karen Kella. And we're back with another episode of the Boozy Bitties. This is the drink as you learn school with two longtime friends. And sometimes we're two boozy bitties. We've all been there, and I'll drink that. You know, the bottom shelf 40s, or Mad Dog 2020, or even 99 cherries. Yeah, it seems like a lot of the cost-friendly booze has a number in its name. And that's no different when it comes to Trader Joe's favorite, Two Buck Chuck. Grab a glass of something affordable and join us. Yeah, so we thought this could be kind of a fun mini-sode. The idea of Two Buck Chuck, something everyone knows by that nickname. It actually goes by the name Charles Shaw Wine, because the original creator of it was named Charles Shaw. But when it became super discounted in price, it became affectionately known as Two Buck Chuck. (laughs) So... And I feel like, yeah, almost everyone's had it, I feel like. I definitely was a big Two Buck Chuck fan, like, when I was living in New York City in my early 20s and, you know, couldn't really afford anything nice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, Trader Joe's has definitely stepped up some of their wine game. The Charles Shaw is still there. I believe it's no longer Two Buck Chuck. I think it's, like, Three Buck Chuck or something like that. I don't know. It's been up and down in price over the years, depending on... I mean, just the quantity of grapes on the market to make bulk wine from. But they also have like a reserve tier now. I think like the Trader Joe's reserve tier. And one of my favorites to get from them is they actually have a Blanc de Blanc. That's true French sparkling wine, Blanc de Blanc. And it's $5. Oh. It's like nothing amazing, but it's the same price as like Cook's or Andre. And it's better quality. And it still makes like a really decent mimosa or sparkling wine cocktail. So that's one of my favorites to pick up at Trader Joe's. Yeah, no, that's good to know. Yeah, I mean, I haven't really gone in a while, but when I, yeah, so I was like, like 24 and it, it was three, but it was two ninety nine, dollars like the mm-hmm. Charles Shaw. But they also did, I remember they would have some other wines that would, would be like four ninety nine, five ninety nine dollars that were... They weren't under the, the brand, but I don't know why they were there. But they were just, I would go and get like a case of all this like under $10 wine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it's not bad. But until like I researched this story about Charles Shaw, I didn't really know really know a lot of the the hiccups, the mistakes, and like the drama behind it. Yeah, and you're the one who like, we were like, what can we do for a mini? And you were like, how about two buck check? And I was like, I don't know anything about it. Sure. So <laughs> Cal is going to give Kara a lesson today, guys. Which is good because Kara is hungover, which is very rare for Kara on a weekday. <laughs> yeah, no, there he is. But yeah, but I hang out at my neighbor's house. They, they, they might listen, actually. <laughs> they sometimes listen. I mean, I don't say anything bad anyway, because I adore spending time over there. But yeah, they made me dinner. So my toddler and I went over and we drank too much wine. Because it happens. It happens. It happens. It happens. Usually, you know, it's me, the one that's hung over on a weekday, but I'll take up the slack for this today right now. There you go. And also, it's like National Drink Wine Day or something while we're recording this. Oh, really? I don't know. One of those, like, made-up holiday things. Happy National Drink Wine Day. That's like our whole thing. Made-up holidays and wine. So (laughs) So, welcome to Two Poke Chuck. (laughs) It's the affordable way to spend a holiday heading into the holiday weekend for President's Day. So, (laughs) So, Charles Shaw... He is the guy behind it. The wine itself dates back to the 1970s. And what I learned is that he actually never earned any money from it, really. Besides, like, maybe in the sale, but that's a little sketchy. But apparently, you know, he was into, I think he was in the banking profession. And he had gone to Paris for a work trip and had always loved wine. And his wife, Lucy, was like, no, you're going to do something that makes us money. And so when he was in Paris, though, he was exposed to a lot of wine, fell in love with it, and somehow convinced his wife that they should now finally open a winery. So they bought a vineyard in California, and they rolled out a gamay, which we love. It's like jammy and light and easy to drink. And that was in 1979. So the original Two Buck Chuck starts as gamay. Which I think is pretty cool. Yeah, but he wasn't going for two buck Chuck then. He was trying to go something more elevated, right? He was. Yeah, the whole point of this was that it was his like passion project and he was looking to make good wine. And so I didn't realize that because I've always known Charles Shaw to be two buck Chuck, that this wine actually won multiple like international awards and gold medals and was also served at like White House dinners and things like that. It was a well respected wine at the time. But then there was just like this series of unfortunate events. Oh, the, the series of unfortunate <laughs> events and a divorce. <laughs> but I mean, his background, he, you know, like I said, he ended up in California in the 1960s. Before that, he was in the Air Force and he traveled the country negotiating contracts. I bet he had a bit of a banking background as well. But he married this girl named Lucy and they had children. And she came 
a very wealthy family. I guess it was a rice farmer family is what I read. And she had inherited a large amount of money that he had convinced her to use to open the winery oh, in so right Napa Valley. <laughs> yeah, kind of a lot of, kind of have a lot of paperwork around a decision <laughs> like that. <but> yeah. <laughs> so they lived out there for a little bit using a lot of her mom's money. And they also took out some bank loans. And this gamay that he created was is doing really well. But I mean, just kind of in certain like upper circles and and wine snob kind of things. Because at the time, we know California has always still been very California Chardonnay and Cabernet heavy. That was still big at the time then too, even bigger. And so gamay was a little bit more of a foreign concept to wine drinkers. I could still see that being even now... Like your average wine drinker isn't going to like go to the wine store and pick a gamay off the shelf. They want to No, it not usually. It's not super common. So I mean, there's kind of the tough point there. He's fighting an uphill battle by deciding to pick a lesser known varietal in California. But I mean, the fact that it was going to the White House dinners and winning awards. I mean, that has to have did that not mean anything. <laughs> like, I mean, you would think that that should do something, but maybe in the time that still wasn't. Like, all that relevant. Like, this is also around the time when, like, California has been going through the Judgment of Paris that we talked about in that one episode. Oh, so then Cabernet is just king. Yeah. Yeah. And and Chardonnay, yeah. The 1970s and stuff like that. And eventually he did start making Chardonnay and Pinot Noir. So he, when he's, like, expanding this, he actually said in one of the interviews I read, his thought to himself was, it was just so wonderful. So the thing is, what could go wrong, right? Because everything had been like kind of going on the up and up for him. <laughs> That's where he got too confident. <laughs> oh, he didn't knock on wood after he said that. <laughs> no, no, he didn't. <laughs> so at one point, his wine was like accidentally polluted by a supplier. Like there was some kind of issue with it and it was bad. Uh, I think that's the beeswax incident. He was buying these oak barrels and instead of using like beeswax in them, they used paraffin wax instead, which tainted the wine. So like millions of dollars worth of wine went bad. <laughs> and then Phylloxera hit some of his vineyards, I guess. <laughs> so, Phylloxera. <laughs> yeah, our buddy Phylloxera. So he lost a bunch of grapes to that. <laughs> and then he tried to do an agreement with like a national distributor. And they agreed to like produce all this Burgundian style wine. But then at the time, like we said, it wasn't popular. So it was like oversold and they had too much of it and it just wasn't going well. <laughs> it's like, so, like, yeah, what, what could go wrong, right? What, what couldn't go wrong? I know <laughs> like, everything can go wrong, especially in wine when you start talking <laughs> smack like that. Yeah. But then, so, and then his wife is just getting like wicked pissed. She's like, I gave you all my family money and like nothing's going well. Everything's mistake after mistake. We're losing it. And so then the bank started calling on their debt too because they didn't have their loans being paid back. So this guy's like struggling for capital and cash right now. He's just not doing so hot. And that I think really hurt his relationship. I mean, what do they say about relationships are never truly tested until a significant loss of a loved one or like financial distress. (laughs) So yeah, until you invest in a business together. Yeah. Yeah. So this was not working at all. Lucy ended up divorcing him. And that apparently not only... Gave him no leg to stand on, broke his heart as well. But she took control of the winery and all the money they had put into it as part of the divorce. And that's so what, what did he get? Nothing? <laughs> nope, pretty much. So that was about $450,000 that he Why owed she in this divorce. Her, she should have had to pay him alimony. I, I don't know how that works. I don't know what their divorce agreement was, Kara. Like, yeah. I didn't get to research that for this episode. I don't think it was, like, quite well, public well, record well, for maybe me. If she, if she came from money, maybe she had a really solid prenup. Well, I am maybe, but also like in an interview, she once said to someone that like she had lost all of her family's money because she had put all of the money into this business. And so when this all went so south, she was like, I'm, I'm broke. Like I got nothing. So I think she took him for everything she could. This, this wine was a really great idea. (laughs) (laughs) So, okay. So why does it still exist then given all of this? Okay, so I guess at the time, the vineyards were, like, snapped up by this local competitor as part of, you know, losing everything in the divorce and selling off the property and whatnot. And it sold to a company that still exists today called Bronco Wine Company, which is a very big supplier of wines in the United States. And at the time, this was run by a familiar name to most people who also like cheap beverages, Fred Franzia. 
So oh. Franzia. I mean, I know Franzia, but I didn't know there was a Fred behind the Franzia. Yes, Fred is the, the Franzia that created the, the, you know, the cheap wine empire. So, so he purchased Charles Shaw's label. And in like the 2002, there was a recession, which started leading to a massive wine surplus. So Franzia's MO and decision that he made here was to offload a lot of these bottles. And they went to Trader Joe's, where he made this deal with Trader Joe, whose name is Joe Cologne, I believe. And he also had ties with Charles Shaw. They apparently were Stanford alum friends together or something like that. So there was this deal that all these like surplus bottles went there. And that's when they decided to sell the wine for $2 a bottle. And they labeled it differently. So it wasn't, you know, the same Charles Shaw label that was initially there, but they kept the name of it. So it was still called Charles Shaw. And now it was like $2 grocery store wine instead of, you know, however much it was, much Going more expensive gimme wine. Yeah, yeah, sold at the, so, you know, served at the White House. Yeah, so that's kind of where it became Two Buck Chuck. And there's all these rumors going around about, like, why is it so cheap? How did it get to that price point where it could be $2 a bottle? And mm-hmm. one of the... Oh, the, gosh, Cal, I'm into the notes. What? You're reading the, the notes for, finally? I'm, I'm foreshadowing. Well, yeah, yeah but there's... <laughs> one really disturbing fact coming up? Yeah, I'm a little yep. upset that I drank the wine. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the, the first rumors is that he slashed his prices to spite his wife and devalue the brand. Because she, remember, has ownership of the winery or in the vineyards and stuff like that. At this so it's point. like, it's like Ted Lasso of wine. It's not like a, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Where she tries to, I mean, I'm, I'm picking up what you're putting down where she's trying know, to sabotage the ex-husband's football club. Team. Yeah. yeah. Be- so. And by getting Ted Lasso to be the coach as from an American football yeah. coach. And, and then yeah, also so they do well. Yeah. S- s- same, same. No, yeah, it's the Ted Lasso <laughs> method. is what we're going for. <laughs> yeah. So that, and Charles Shaw claims that no, 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 that never happened. Another rumor was that, they use this mechanical claw for harvesting, and it's not very great at filtering other non-wine products or grape products within the pick. So mm-hmm. that there were a bunch of branches, dead birds, and insects that were also fermented and kind of used as filler with the grapes to cut down costs. So this, I think, should be the gin craze method, where they're just putting like <laughs> sawdust and turpentine into the gin to make it cheaper and easier to make multiple quantities of. But yeah. what disturbed me the most is that that's not totally illegal. The FDA actually does have requirements on how much bird and bug guts are okay in your wine. So how do they test that? That's I a don't, question. We should have asked Mari. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, maybe we can get some FDA person on here to talk about the parameters of wine because I guess it's totally okay. It just happens that you're going to... like Bugs don't bother me as much as like full birds. Yeah. Yeah, the bugs I can get away like, with. Like, fer- like fermenting bird carcasses. Yeah. So that was the other one. And so today, he's actually, I mean, Charles Shaw is still alive. He works for a tech company. He lives in Chicago. (laughs) (laughs) He has no claim to his wine. He has no say about anything except his name is on it. Um, (laughs) Yeah, it's not like... (laughs) It's really a very, I don't know, demoralizing story. I know. You'd think... Poor Charles Shaw. Let's buy a two-buck truck back for him. Let's start a campaign. (laughs) Because it's just like now this wine is sold. I mean, at every Trader Joe's that's allowed to sell wine, and it's super popular. It's definitely lost the the quality of taste. I know it's definitely become a more sweeter style, and it's but it's what you expect when you're paying two dollars for a bottle. Like you're not going to open it and be alarmed by the bad taste of it. You'd be like, this is what I probably expected. Some fermented bird guts. Yes. And, and is that, is that like a, a, a note of spider on the back palate that I'm getting there? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's just it didn't really seem to go well from him once he finally like achieves his dream of opening this winery and getting like some initial success over it like after that everything just went downhill still alive working in tech lives in a high rise apparently in chicago from what i understand but he actually you know he said it, it in the beginning, I think it was a problem that it was devalued, but I appreciate the way that he took this and looked at it. In one of the interviews I read, he said, you know, I actually like the name Two Buck Chuck. It ties it to me. It's better than the brand disappearing or being forgotten forever. Oh, All right. So he's an optimist. <laughs> he's, yeah, I mean, he's, just, he, he's a half gl- glass half full kind of guy. Yeah, <laughs> half gamay glass full. <laughs> But well, my wife and my winery and <laughs> yeah so i mean he got nothing from i think the sale probably whenever it went through or whatever was to i mean 
probably pay back some of the debts. I just unplugged my microphone shit. Well, that we're at our 15 oh. minute mark. So we okay, hope you good. enjoyed <laughs> this episode about two bucks. Do it again. We'll see you next time. Bye everyone. Go double fist yourselves. Bye.